They are an ancient species of flowering plants that grow submerged in all of the world's oceans, from the latitudes of northern Alaska to the tip of South America. Seagrasses evolved during the age of the dinosaurs nearly a hundred million years ago and are found today in bays and estuaries around the globe. In shallow tropical and subtropical waters, these prairies of the sea link the offshore coral reefs with coastal mangrove forests. They provide food and shelter for many marine species that will one day inhabit the reefs. Seagrasses and mangroves stabilize coastal sediments and create buffers against storm surge and flooding. They remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, filter contaminants from coastal waters, and add value to local economies. But seagrasses are in decline globally, and mangroves are being lost to coastal development. These areas are degrading right now. It's not 50 years from now or 100 years from now, but it's occurring right now. The rate at which we're losing seagrass habitat globally could result in an ecosystem collapse from the bottom of the food chain all the way up. Will restoring seagrass and mangrove communities help sustain the ecological and economic values of the oceans, bays, and estuaries? And how will rising sea levels impact their survival in the future? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. Over the last few decades, Worldwide human populations have increased dramatically along coastlines. At the same time, seagrasses have declined at a rate of nearly 7% per year, a rate higher than the loss of coral reefs or tropical rainforests. Stormwater runoff from coastal communities and human activities along the shoreline contribute to the decline. Boat groundings and anchor damage add to the problem. Unlike the more recognizable icons of the seas, the value of seagrasses and mangroves can be easily overlooked. If you just casually read newspapers and places that science stories are published, you often read about tropical forests, you often read about coral reefs, and, and occasionally you'll even read about mangroves, but you almost never read about seagrasses. Uh, seagrasses uh, are the rodney danger field of, of uh, coastal marine ecosystems. They really get no respect. But researchers have discovered that seagrasses and mangroves deserve a great deal of respect for their many values in the ocean. Seagrasses keep erosion down, they lock sediments into the bottom, and they actually remove sediments from the water column. And when that happens, that maintains a clear water column so a lot of light reaches the bottom. If the seagrasses were to disappear, then all of a sudden they're no longer holding these sediments in place. Sediments get up in the water, and the water becomes very, very turbid. That's really important when you're thinking about um, areas that are heavily populated, where folks like to recreate, where sediments can be stirred up, they kind of root them down and keep them stable, and they provide some hurricane protection, much like mangroves do on a global scale. You've got seagrasses and mangroves that break wave action when storms come, and that also provide nature's way of, of stabilizing the shoreline. We live in an area of the world where we get these catastrophic storm events, hurricanes and tropical storms, and when they hit the coast, 
they can definitely create er erosion problems. And what we find is that areas that are protected or buffered by mangrove forest and wetlands tend to do much better. And then we lose a lot of coastline in areas where we removed mangroves and replaced them with things like seawalls. Still, some of the most important values of these resources are less obvious. It's been shown about a hectare of seagrass, which is equivalent to a soccer field, can use the same amount of nitrogen that would come from treated sewage from 800 people in one year. And then if you're looking at the carbon numbers, seagrass can fix the same amount of carbon per meter squared in a year that you would produce by driving your car 7,500 miles. Just the amount of nitrogen that they pick up is worth $19,000 a year for that one little spot of seagrass. And you start to look at everything else that's associated with them, you're not talking a monetary amount for fisheries, because you've got the shrimp industry down here in South Florida, you've got all of the sports fishing, as well as most of the fish from either the mangroves or the coral reefs having some sort of connection with seagrass. Seagrasses and mangroves provide the nursery habitat, the foundation of our, our ecosystem. And without having a healthy nursery habitat where fishery industries can survive and our tourism industry thrives because we've got this industry that depends on having nice clear water and habitat where fish can grow both for sustainability and sustenance for people to eat and also for our tourism industry where people like to recreate from the basic part of that food chain up through human consumption, you would have really a, an ecosystem collapse. It certainly is a crisis. Uh, seagrasses are very valuable for the ecosystem services they provide, besides being just hotspots of biodiversity and beautiful places to visit. I'm fascinated by seagrass habitats. On the surface, you look at a seagrass habitat and you see a bunch of green grass, essentially that doesn't look too different from your lawn, for example. But seagrasses, are, or the habitats, are incredibly complex. There are so many different organisms that live there. There's so many different biogeochemical cycles and processes that are going on in there. If you put your face up close to a seagrass habitat, you'll be amazed at the number of different things that you'll see on the small scale. In the subtropical waters of southeast Florida, neighboring metropolitan Miami Biscayne Bay Aquatic Preserve manages nearly 70,000 acres of submerged land. Nearly three quarters of that is covered by seagrass. Mangrove forested islands and shorelines grow adjacent to these seagrass communities. The most common variety, red mangroves, are found growing at the water's edge. Behind them, black mangroves, and farther upland, white mangroves. Historically, Biscayne Bay received fresh water from the Everglades, but in modern times, the hydrology has been altered by drainage canals, channelized rivers, and changes in the flow of groundwater into the bay. The diversity of species has also changed, but it still remains an estuary where fresh water and salt water meet. One of the things that we do is um, form partnerships with uh, local resource agencies, universities, researchers who are looking at what the resources are in Biscayne Bay so that we can get a better understanding of what's there now, but also how have things changed and how are they changing. Marine biologists are monitoring salinity, sediments, and organisms that live on seagrasses found in Biscayne Bay with a long-term goal of determining what effect a new freshwater canal flowing into the bay will have on the ecosystem. This project is directly related to the Everglades Restoration Project. And what's going to be happening is the freshwater regime of South Florida is going to be changing. And everybody that's involved wants to try to get an idea of what and how these changes are going to be affecting what's already here. Overall, if you have salinities changing on a much larger scale, then you start getting into chemistry a lot more. 
how warmer waters are going to be, you know, acidifying with higher levels of CO2. That's going to be affecting how the sediments actually work or don't work. Uh, it starts to get pretty ugly pretty quick. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. Photo archival data of the seagrass beds is recorded with a specially designed boat and shallow water positioning system known as swaps. We got a glass bottom boat so that you can see the stuff that's out there. We've got a digital camera attached to the glass bottom. We can move that around as we need to. That runs directly through a computer, goes straight to a hard drive. We've got GPS, so it codes every photo with exactly where it is. Even if we're doing a straight line or just trying to sit in one spot, that each one of these is tagged so precisely that we can follow it around because seagrass doesn't grow all the time as just one big meadow like your yard, there's gonna be little patches of it. This gives us uh, a nice snapshot of the community as it is right up against the mangroves and how that changes as it moves into a little bit deeper water. And we're going out and year after year taking photo quadrats basically and so that way, in the future, we can always come back if we need to check for any specific organisms or any specific changes that we may have missed on our preliminary analysis. Seagrass and mangrove communities in Biscayne Bay nurture juvenile fish and marine creatures that feed and find shelter here. Some will make their way offshore to the coral reefs. Others will live out their entire life cycles in the bay. More than a hundred bottlenose dolphins reside in the bay, stalking fish around the seagrass beds. Seagrasses are a primary food source for manatees, but as opportunistic feeders, they will consume low-hanging mangrove leaves. Seagrasses in tropical and subtropical bays and estuaries around the world have a relationship with mangroves, like prairies do to forests on land. A good example of this is along the, uh, the mangrove fringe down in the southern part of the aquatic preserve near Chicken Key in the Deering Estate. Um, you've got uh, an expansive mangrove forest right adjacent to the shoreline, and then out from that um, for a few miles, you've got um, dense seagrass beds. 